Hello, hello and welcome to the October featured designer chat guest speaker. Um, so excited to be here. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with me and my work, I've been a little bit quieter on Instagram lately. Uh, I've been doing a lot more behind the scenes stuff. So it's really fun to be able to, to chat with you here. And I'm so excited to have Natalie with me today. If this is your first time joining a featured designer chat, I I host these every month to to feature another knitting pattern designer and to really dive deep into their work, their story, what they do as as a designer and how they got where they are. So we talk about, about their history a little bit. We talk about their life outside of knitting and designing. We talk about their design process, all of those things. Um, so I'm really excited to have Natalie join me today. Looks like she's not quite on yet, but um, if you don't know who I am, hello, welcome. I am Jessica, I'm the knitting pattern designer and uh, design coach, business coach, all of the things here at Synchrodoodle Knits and behind the pattern design circle. And Natalie's here. Actually, Natalie was inside the design circle as a guest in July, I believe. Uh, she talked about designing raglan sleeves and she'll be back in the design circle December, I think, to talk about fun with factorials. So, hello. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Nice to see you. I am. It's so good to see you too. <laughs> You'll have to remind me what time it is there again. Um, it's just, just after five o'clock, so I think I'm um, five hours ahead of Eastern. Okay, yes. So it's lunchtime here and it's dinner time there. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. How are you today? I'm all right, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. And I see that you're wearing the design that you sneak peeked for us in the side the design circle. I was, when I was looking for images to use for Instagram for this chat, I was looking for that to see if you'd published it yet. <laughs> no, not, not yet. I know. I'm chasing, chasing my tail a little bit with this one. It'll be out by the um, end of the month I'm aiming for. Um, oh, it is so just been, I didn't think I've just um, under, well, tight timing is timing. Start of term and things like that. When you're a teacher, it just goes a bit mental. Um, <laughs> yeah. But no, this is um, the. It's going to be called the um, Korean sweater, and it's named after Karin Mark Tanchak of the Periwinkle Sheep. Oh, um, yes. And um, it's using her non-superwash um, worsted yarn, and it's really lovely, perfect for ribs <laughs> like this. Oh, so cozy. Yeah. I yeah. I want one in like three colors already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, she's got lots of gorgeous colors, honestly. I mean, I was so spoiled for choice working with her. Um, she's, a, she's an amazing dyer and I was just could not wait. I just, it's one of those things where you just love the yarn so much, you don't want it to stop. And um, yeah. Yes, that's so lovely. Um, okay, so one of my favorite questions to ask to start off these these featured designer chats is to ask you three words to describe yourself so that folks can understand who you are as a person oh goodness um <laughs> <laughs> and everybody has the same response but <laughs> i still ask it so. yeah oh dear this is the thing when you ask questions you get to be like put us in the torture chamber <laughs> you're into it. Um, <laughs> Um, I think probably, um, thoughtful. Um, I think that's one word that comes up from other people. They always, um, thoughtful comes up a lot. And I do, I do think a lot, occasionally too much, but I just <laughs> like to, um, I just, I like to make sure all angles covered and sometimes it occasionally bleeds into perfectionism, but, um, I just like to make sure that I've, you know, I haven't cut corners basically. Yeah. Um, so that's one. Um, another one. Um, I would say, well, if, if there's one word to describe 
researchy, con like bookwormish, conscientious, that kind of thing. Um, I like, I'm the kind of person that has loads of tabs open on the internet. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> because just I find closed so many tabs yesterday <laughs> because my partner, my spouse, he always is getting upset with me for how many tabs I have open. <laughs> I love oh, that. that's no honestly it's like it's only when things start to run a little bit slowly that I start to realize oh okay I should probably start bookmarking these but you know how it is you start getting into this um, rabbit hole you find something that's really interesting and you think um okay I want to find out more about that and um then you're just like oh okay and you're following following up following up and um then before you know it, you've just got so many things open and um I have gone back to things and thought why on earth was I reading that yeah. I can't imagine <laughs> what that was connected to um and so yeah so definitely um rabbit hole bookworm kind of person that's not one word but I'm hyphenating it yes and I think the third one, gosh, I'm going to cop out and say creative. <laughs> that, that works. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, I thought, uh, the, especially, you know, the, the creating something out of nothing and um, problem solving aspect of creativity, I, I identify with that a lot. Um, and, um, yeah, I think that's yes. definitely me. I love that. Thank you so much for playing along. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Now, I'll, I'll torture you a little bit more. I haven't asked anybody <laughs> else, but do you have three words that you would use to like, describe like your business or your designs, what you try to create or do for people? Um, yeah, I'm kind of, I mean, I try to, I think evergreen is one, definitely, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, with knit, it's something that takes a long time. It's an invest, it's an investment of time, of mm -hmm. money, and um, I think like the least I can do um, as a designer is just to create something that is going to be a bit of a workhorse as far as the wardrobe is concerned, but also to um, that's versatile. You know, I don't want I don't I'm not the kind of person who follows trends a lot. If I was to, if I were to do that, I would like nod to it maybe in the form of color mm -hmm. rather than the styling, because mm -hmm. um, there's some things that and it, it's just there's just some things I think will just work from year to year from person to person and, and what I hope to build up with my um, design catalogue is to just have a collection or portfolio of things that you know someone can you know identify with or can or can pick something out for themselves that will work because um, I think it kind of leads into another um, adjective I would use I think um, well independent or self-assured I think is the kind of thing I have in mind um, for the people I design patterns for um, because it tends to be people who have a sense of their own style already and I think in some ways that happens by default when you make your own clothes obviously it can yeah. be as trend-led as you want it to be yeah but I think that you know most of the time when you're making your own clothes you have a really good sense of what does and doesn't suit you mm -hmm. so um, I tend to just say well this is how I would wear it but I also know that you know other people you know put their own stamp on it and they often do it's really I love seeing um, finished objects of yeah. um, mine that people have made up and they've just you know they've lengthened it and I encourage people to customize it to suit themselves as well not just fit but I also think you know you could also, all, also do this um, you could easily lengthen and shorten it and um, yeah and it's, it's, it's the best bit for me um, seeing other people put their own stamp on my work because it's just a starting point really yes um and if you're and anything the, like me you have a hundred different ideas of how you could customize it but you don't have the time to knit all of those samples so. yeah exactly and you know and sometimes it's really nice to just um you know if you have something that is really well designed in that regard it's lovely to then just come back to it or revisit it further down the line and think oh okay I can reinterpret it in this way and it brings it back to life because I think um one of the things that I think I've been thinking about a lot lately is how easy it is when you design or you know or create products you how easy it is to get trapped into the endless like launching of things and just you know novelty and the thing that it's really handy to try and keep in mind is that it just because it's new to you doesn't mean it won't be new to anyone else you know sometimes it takes people ages to see things um 
I mean, for example, my little garden account, I used to have my garden stuff and my stories on my main account here. And I moved it to another Instagram account um, earlier this year. And I'm pretty sure there are people who still don't know about it. Um, I don't. And, you know, and, you know, so you have to just keep, you know, telling people what you have, I think, you know, showing that it's still relevant and, um, you know, not making people feel like, you know, there's a lot of pressure to keep up. So I feel like that can affect um, knitters as well as designers. It can be, it can make what is essentially a really slow, mindful hobby into something that's a bit more like um, high street fashion or something like that. Yes, um, so much. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I'm definitely in that, like the same kind of space of, like this isn't meant to be, a competition of who can get the most stuff out there when we're not trying to make knitters and makers feel overwhelmed by all of the options. Like when everybody's just launching all these patterns, how do you, like, there's no way we can already knit all of the things we have in mind, let alone all of the new things. So then how can we as designers encourage this more sustainable and thoughtful, intentional making that, that actually helps both the designer and the knitter. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and it gives you more of an opportunity, I think, to have a relationship with people who do knit your designs. I mean, I think that community side of it um, is really important, especially, you know, with um, the pandemic and being locked down and people really wanting that sense of connection and community. And um, I think that, you know, the people that you have on your mailing list or in your Instagram community they're really important because you know they come looking for you and I think on this account it's way it, it's it's way too big now I think somehow I mean, I've had been on Instagram since 2013 I think and I think after a, a while I had to just stop following people because I wasn't seeing anybody and then yes. started following them from my other account um <laughs> instead which is nothing to do with knitting but it's just like I could see what they're up to people I've been speaking to for um you know years on here um and it's just taking just giving people time it's really important um and equally respecting the time available that people have available to make as well because yeah. you know that can spoil the fun otherwise yeah and if we're as designers creating non-stop patterns to launch we're mm -hmm. we're making non-stop and that's our full-time thing i mean for some of us it is yeah. and mm -hmm. then how can you expect your audience to be able to make all of the things that you're creating that quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it is really difficult. I, mean, I actually had someone, um, I think early this year on Twitter, um, she said that, you know, she got in, she was relatively new to knitting, I think. And um, she said that after a while, she just felt so overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that was launching. She felt like she had to keep up. Um, mm -hmm. And then she actually just stopped for a few months and then, you know just had to take a break from it because it wasn't what you know she thought it was going to be and I just thought oh gosh I'm really well, I said, well, first I'm really glad you came back but it just goes to show that you know if one person says something you often find out that other people feel the same way and again that's the whole community side of it isn't it yeah yeah and I think where we are in our world in general there's so much overwhelm already around us and then when we're just adding to that overwhelm with a craft that is meant to relax you from the overwhelm that it's just yeah. causing more more disruption and chaos <laughs> yeah exactly and um i mean i think i mean that is another thing that i like to build into my designs as well i mean just this sense of mindfulness i mean mm -hmm. always try to work with textures and create shapes that you know people can easily get into a rhythm with and um I love when it works in the, again, I'm looking at people's and finished objects and saying, oh, this one, oh, this, this went along really quickly or, oh, this didn't take so long. All that, those kinds of things. I thought that's exactly what I want to do, especially with garments, because um, I do have, I do have accessory patterns, but I feel like um, because my background is more in clothes making and pattern cutting, um, I'm very much on safer ground with clothes. It comes along more slowly, but um, I kind of think, well, you know, the person who's going to be making stuff, it's happening in their spare time. There's a lot to think about in terms of fit than there is than with a hat or a scarf or gloves, for example. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like the least that I can do is let them, you know, take their mind off of some other things, like not make the patterns too complex, um, make sure that wrong side rows are like, 
you know, like old school patterns would say, work each stitch as it appears or um, just a plain pearl or knit row. I just try to put as many of those things into the pattern as possible so that mm -hmm. you actually have more short term memory available to concentrate on other things that can make it your own bespoke thing. Um, and, you know, I think when you design knitting patterns, you're kind of going into someone else's private world, really, when you think about it, when you think about the places that people knit as well. I mean, um, when I had a commute, a, a really long commute, it used to be, it used to be an hour and a half um, one way. Um, I used to spend a lot of time on the train knitting and um, you just would have, you're in your own little bubble and, um, you know, on the, or in the corner of the sofa or maybe in the knit group. Um, you know, it's your own little personal space that um, I think you kind of by proxy get invited into when you design patterns. And I think being mindful of how others want to treat that space just as it is when you send email newsletters and things like that is really important. So, yeah, I try to honour that as much as I can, I think. It's a big it's a big job. I don't really don't make life easy for myself at all. But um yeah, you only answer three adjectives in the first question, so I can't give you any more. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so did you have did you have more adjectives you wanted to use to describe your your work or did we pretty well cover it with the, with the long No, hits? no, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it could get, get to a snowball effect. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, so I want to learn more about how, I mean, and I'm sure the audience, because we, we love these stories, but how did you get into knitting and then designing and then teaching? What was that whole story? Mm -hmm. So it began with my family, um, really. So um, my great grandmother used to be a machinist for uh, Marks and Spencers, which is a UK. I don't know if they have that in the um, US or Not Canada. Sure. It's, it's basically, it's like it's more or less a department store, but it has a stronger focus on, say, clothing and food. And when they used to have UK manufacturing, uh, my great grand was one of the outworkers. She used to take work in and so while she was looking after her grandchildren, which was which would have been my mum would have been one of those children. Um, and then one of my grand uncles was a tailor. And so there's a lot of making going on through a lot of my maternal side and on my paternal side as well, although um, they were around less often when I was growing up. So I grew up having clothes made for me pretty often. Um, it was definitely a, a cheaper option back then. Um, and on my local high street growing up, we used to have a department store. And um, the merchandisers were very thoughtful because they used to have the haberdashery right next to the toys. <laughs> so my mum used to go and look in the remnant section for a bit of fabric to make a little dress for me. Um, the yarn would be there and they'll just be you know, in, in sight playing with Lego or something like that. So it was always it was it was always around. And so I was a lot of knowledge about um, making um, clothes from a really tender age and it's kind of stayed in that kind of in that domestic space for most of my life really um it was not really until i i turned i was in my late teens definitely when i got into knitting proper picking up more consistently sewing i've kind of carried on a little bit um and so it, it wasn't until i think i was in my mid 20s that i thought you know i would like to make this part of you know how i make a living um, at that point, I was working in higher education, which is, which partly feeds into the teaching side of things. I was more a research assistant at that point and was getting really fed up with that because it was more isolating kind of job. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I think I'd rather do something more social than teach. So um, everything kind of dovetailed in about 2010-ish, I think, because that's when I um, finished my conversion course at London College of Fashion and then I was to do um, fashion design and then to get the job with Rowan Yarns which involves some teaching and um, I mentioned at my interview with them I wanted to teach and then I think they gave me about a week's grace to say right you can do the hour teaching on the shop floor in John Lewis which is another department store which has <laughs> yarn and things so I was like oh okay <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be quite so soon um but it's you know it was, be, it was being thrown in at the deep end for sure with the teaching but in some ways um that's the nicest way to do it because you don't have any time to overthink or be afraid and 
And at that point, it was just like an hour teaching, basically. People could turn up at around 11 or half 11, and it would just be some sort of like learn to knit, something very, a very basic snippet of a technique. And um, yeah, I would do that. And it got to the point where I was doing the most Saturdays. And I thought, I quite like this. And um, then it grew into teaching for local businesses um, um, in, in London. And one of them became So Over It, which is now more international. And um, then it was more working in universities and colleges. And I haven't really left. So, um, yeah, everything is just sort of from 2010 onwards, the teaching and then the designing, I, that was nurtured once I started to work for Rowan as well. So then I was sort of like, I could ask the designers questions like, oh, I've always wondered about this. How does this work? And um, they were really helpful and supportive. They were happy to ask questions and going up to visit the mill for the annual meetings and things. It was a really good um, insight and exposure so that when the time came and I felt okay, I'm going to try and see if anyone who has no obligations to me thinks that my stuff is actually nice. Um, that, that watershed moment, I thought, okay, if it works, it works. If anyone, if no one likes it, no one likes it. And I know what to do with my time. And yeah, then I think 2013 was when I started publishing designs and it's been pretty consistent since then. Yes. So, yeah. yeah, that's so fun. Um, and then your designs... Have they mostly been third party published? I can't remember. Um, yeah, that, yeah mm -hmm. they, they have been. I mean, I didn't really open my pan shop until I think 18 months ago, actually. 18 months ago this month. It was April 2021. But yeah, it was third, third party to begin with. And I felt that was, that was a really good bit of advice. I would recommend that, I think, to a lot of people starting out because it can be a really lonely thing trying to self-publish. There's a lot to think about. And then when you go for a magazine or journal or anything like that any kind of periodical you've got that in-house support from the editorial team and that helped immensely mm -hmm. um and so that was and that was e also easy to fit alongside my teaching job as well um they all just it, it blended really well it was manageable yes yes i love that um, um yeah but that... i really admire anyone who just goes straight in sorry oh. I nope. think the thing might be jumped. No, sorry, I thought you were asking something. <laughs> no, go ahead. I yeah, there was definitely. I think there was a lag. There was a, a spinning circle. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'll just say, yeah, I'll just say it's a good safety net for anyone starting out. I think there's so much to think about when you are um, publishing designs, and it's a lot. It's a lot of pressure, and then you find out that so much of the work is about not designing than it is about designing, and it's nice to have a chance to assimilate that before you get too deep, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And um, I haven't done a lot of third party publishing. I, mm -hmm. for the longest time, was convinced that I want to enjoy it because I want to have as much of a relationship with my customers. And, you know, like I was really interested in being involved from the beginning to the end with, you know, collaborating with the yarn dyer and then taking my own photos and all of that kind of thing. Um, but I just did my first third party pattern this year. I'm like, wait, I love this. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. they, it, like, it really is so much more supportive than I thought it would be. And um, obviously they, they cover a lot of the, <laughs> a lot yeah. of different parts and, you know, obviously every person has to, way that I don't know if I would have loved it as much you know two years ago as I do now because of where I'm at um and so but can't can't change the past either way <laughs> but um, yeah, exactly. I would say I mean, you make it work for you don't you yeah yeah um you know sometimes there's designers who who feel like they have to be really good before they work with a third party um but the truth is like the third party has all of these resources and they already have the sizing charts and you know all of these things where you don't have to have it all figured out before you work with them <laughs> exactly I mean it's, it's so much nicer but I love that that's worked out for you now and I kind of like everything in its own time because I think mm -hmm. in some ways it's partly about playing to your own your own personal strengths in the beginning isn't it mm -hmm. and um I know that 
you know, even if I had had more time, I don't know if I could have taken on the responsibility of coordinating photo shoots and things like that, or just going going it alone. Mm -hmm. um, whereas for you to do that, I mean, that is that is immensely brave. I could not <laughs> have done that. So hats off to you. <laughs> it's just amazing. But um, but you know, I think the thing the thing that I think sometimes people miss with design is that it's a team effort. Um, and you know, you've got, you know, you've obviously it's going to have the designer's name or the, the idea generator's name on the pattern, if you want, for want of a more club, less clumsy term. But um, you know, there's a lot of people involved as well, and I think that, you know, when you work with third party, that kind of thing is really brought home to you, and mm -hmm. um, especially when it begins as a hobby, um, isn't it? Because it's your own spare time; it's just you, and then you know, before you know it, it's grown into something that actually does need to involve other people and, and you forget to ask for help or maybe want to try and find other resources. And I think now, I think it's a little bit easier in that I think there's more support for people. Like um, Tech Editor Hub is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, Tech Tip Forks is amazing. I love them so much. They just talk about, you know, how stuff works. And then your pattern design circle also um, and that stuff wasn't around in 2010 at all. There was just nothing. We had Ravelry, um, crickets, um, <laughs> yarn company. Well, um, even and even when it I was, started... it was, I remember thinking it was so hard. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, because um, I just thought, and I think it was only like the other day I was thinking, what would I have done if I hadn't been working for Owen? It would have been really, really difficult if I hadn't worked for a yarn company and had that in, had that insight. Um, and so, you know, having you know spaces like this where you and I can talk, which would not have been possible again at that time either mm -hmm. um, about things, um, is really, really important. It's good for knitters, it's good for designers, it's good for everybody. Yes, oh. yes, that is such a a good point to bring up. Wow, there's so many of us that are kind of frustrated with social media and really seeing the negative mm -hmm. side of it, but in it also has you know connected us with so many people. It's brought us yeah. so many of those resources and friendships, and you know that it's it's pretty amazing too. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, I think you have to think you have to remember that social media is not the master. I kind of like to think about it as a kind of, you know, marketplace or town square kind of thing or a high street. It's kind of like, well, you know, if you want to go out and just hang out and see see what everyone's doing, it's much easier because you can just think, oh, look up this person. You can just talk to each other. It's much easier to do that. And then I think, um, you know, once you see somebody that you like, like or want to get to know better then you can go to their website then you can join their mailing list and then you can you know connect with them um on a more personal level because you know when you have emails you can see people's names people can reply to you um i think you know the mistake is when people feel like they have to be on social media all the time or they or you know you get this business advice saying oh get all the accounts before your name's taken and you have to be on everywhere but really you know you just have to go one you have to one find a space where fellow knitters are as well it's a combination of what you enjoy doing and where your people are i think but yes but yeah i mean Absolutely. it's done so much good instagram youtube all that stuff i love it yeah yes uh something i shared with one of my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients was she was struggling a lot with Instagram and my recommendation to her was take off the pressure treat it like your playground like that's where you go have fun and you can be yourself your silly self your whatever you know like don't don't feel like this is like coming into a work conference where you have to be tidy and quiet and fit into their mold kind of thing um yeah. and and that's, that's really been helpful for her. And I feel like that aligns exactly with what you said. Like, <laughs> this, this is, it's a tool, um, but it's not our whole business. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, um, and that's it. And I think, you know, us being on the same page just exemplifies the whole point about social media. It's just finding like-minded people and then just filtering things out. Um, I mean, I forget that the filter controls are there sometimes. I mean, um, but you know, you just you just you just do what you can with it. And most of all, that 
it works it works for you because if it doesn't work for you then there's just absolutely no point <laughs> no yes yes <laughs> yes um uh, okay do you want to share more about like you just i feel like you love the whole technical aspects of knitting and designing and that's that's related to obviously your whole research side um what do you love to nerd out about with knitting <laughs> Um, oh, I think I like the, um, I like the engineer. I like, I like all of it. I mean, I think the technical side fascinates me because it's, I think next lifetime I want to be an engineer. Um, I love the engineering aspects of it because, you know, you're building something and engineering is so inherently creative. Um, it just, it just, you know, encapsulates so many things. Um, I just love the idea of building. I like building pattern, um, building shapes, and how they relate to bodies as well. I mean, I, I absolutely love um, fitting and teaching people how to fit when I teach dressmaking classes. It's my, one of my favorite things, just seeing. And that relationship between 2D fabric and 3D bodies is something that I never get tired of. It's one of the hardest things to um, learn, I think, when you design clothes, but it never gets old because there are so many, there's so much uniqueness in people and um, how they dress, how they look, how they're shaped. And um, I think the technical aspects of it fascinate me because um, you just, the possibilities are endless. It's just really, it's really fascinating. And I like the um, conceptual um, artistic side of design as well. I mean, that's, that's equally beautiful but it it just doesn't get me as um as excited because i think partly for the reason i just said i just love the engineering but also um because um i feel like you have the, i feel like clothes are just inherently practical is what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. i mean they can be they can be beautiful of course and really inspiring and you know wearable art but i can never completely let go of the fact that they need to do a job and I think in some ways that probably does limit me as a designer because I cannot get out of my head the practical function you know what is this meant to do it's a practical item um, and I don't necessarily go off and do wonderful wonderful things that other designers would do um, necessarily in terms of I don't know I don't know. There are some things I would just never come up with, but that, but the good thing is just that there's room for everybody. But mm -hmm. it just means that um, what I do, what I do create, is always gonna have its feet on the ground. I'm just very, you know, practical in a way. And um, you know, I think at one point I think I would have let that um, upset me. Um, there was one point when I was studying where one of the teachers actually said I wasn't worried about you until I saw your sketchbook and um, <laughs> and it was just because I just thought you know the whole I mean I can, I can draw don't get me wrong I love I love drawing I love that um, I love the, the doodling the mark making that side of it but it was really hard for me at the time to convey exactly what um, I was passionate about in terms of design and I think that in some ways when you're self-taught you can express yourself visually on your own terms when um, you know when you go to college or a minute like like I like I did um, they're very much getting you ready for what the industry understands by creative mm -hmm. and I think it took me about a term to understand oh okay this is how they understand xyz so I need to do it like this and it became a bit more of a political exercise than me necessarily growing but um, in a way it was it was it was good um so after that term when i had that comment from one of the shooters i just thought okay okay if this is what you lot want i'll let you have it so um the second term um they gave us this really weird um brief it was called dislocate relocate and um, i thought okay i'll put something where it shouldn't be so and i apologize if this made anybody squeamish um I got some jewellery because I was into jewellery making for a bit and I just thought I know I'm gonna and then um, we had some um, duck that was being cooked for Christmas dinner and I just dressed up the duck in the jewellery and that became my visual research um, so <laughs> 
but I know it's absolutely absolutely gross I know it was just really macabre I was just making it stand up and walk and things I just thought okay fine um but um it helped to get me an interview with John Lewis <laughs> designing children's wear of all things <laughs> Oh, I um, love that story. <laughs> That's hilarious. It is mad, but and again, I think um, it just it just shows, you know, just be, people just just be true to yourself. Just because you don't not you might not necessarily be around people who understand you in the beginning, but you'll always find your people. I mean, there's billions of us on the planet. You're going to find the ones who like you. It just might it just might take some time. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes. I love that so much. I'm finding it really fascinating. Like we share very similar interests and such but like came at it from such different perspectives i was the engineering student um who got bored with the monotony of doing the same thing over and over again in engineering and felt like it wasn't creative enough and ended up doing knitwear design because that's like the artsy and so like i kind of i basically started off by all right, how much fun can I have with this? I was never like out there in terms of really unique, whatever, but mostly just like playing with textures and kind of going overboard for me. Like I'm very much a practical, I like to wear gray all of the time. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a very big, but like my designs at first were like totally, it was like really trying to push that creative artsy stuff for me because it was lacking. And now I'm finally kind of pulling back to like, all right, this is actually me. This is like the practical side. I still love the math side and, you know, like really finding, finding that spot that, you know, I feel like you're kind of, you, it's kind of a similar spot to where you are, where it's, it's the mathy technical stuff, but also the beauty and simplicity and practicality of it all too. Yeah. No, but this is it. I mean, this is this is why we get we we we've, we've got on so well whenever we've um, met online because, you know, I mean, like I said, I, I really do love engineers. I just love the fact that you had that in your background when then we first um, got in touch, and I just thought, oh my gosh, she did that degree. I would, would have loved to have done. Do, um, <laughs> and um, and it's just and it's just wonderful. It's kind of like you know exactly as you were saying. It's like you're just looking to try and reconnect with a part of yourself that's been a bit buried. And then also then you're getting to articulate what that means for you as a creative person, and especially when you're working under, you know, someone else's direction. I mean, I don't know what it's like for engineering degrees. Do they always set you a project brief or do you get to um, come up with your own thing? Oh, they, they say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I was I was an architectural engineer with emphasis mm -hmm. in mechanical systems. So mostly what I was my degree was to design like heating and cooling systems and stuff like that. So I'm just like, okay. how boring could that be? But the reason I had gone that direction was because it was like, it felt like the most potential for doing something new and different with sustainability stuff. But I ended up, I really did love buildings, like the architecture side, um, but I was burnt out and my mental health could not deal with going to grad school for architectural school. So that's, that's where I was like, all right, I need that creativity, artsy stuff, but this is not the path for me right now. So what am I going to do instead? And I did not, I, I really didn't think of myself as a creative or artistic person. I didn't think I could, I mean, I'm not great at drawing. So um, and, uh, I, I laugh that I can't even, you know, draw a stick figure. But um, I, so I, I didn't think I would, could ever design patterns. I was like, I don't, I don't have the creativity. I don't like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I need something creative. And I was kind of just wandering. And suddenly one day I, I started to have all these design ideas. I know they've just been flowing nonstop ever since. So, you know, some things that's you just have to wait for the moment and, and then it starts. Exactly. <laughs> but I mean, the one thing I would say to you, don't feel bad about your drawing. I'm gonna show you something that will make you feel instantly better. Okay. Can you see this? Yes. This is a plan for a, a design idea. Not it's not gonna win the Turner Prize, but <laughs> It gets, it gets you the idea. I mean, and to be honest, a lot of my 
designs i very rarely spend time on like illustration because as far as i'm concerned that is a completely different skill set to design mm -hmm. and one of the things that i disliked about college um both as a student and then teaching on a fashion degree was um i felt like they overemphasized the drawing side of things mm -hmm. because really what you need to do with visual communication is just, just let people into your mind and show you this is how it's going to work and this is where you're going with it so they can you know see oh, oh okay okay we can see what, how, that, how that's going whereas if you want something that's artistic and is going to be used as part of maybe a um sales brochure or presentation then you recruit an illustrator to draw it for you and they can use all their fine art experience to um sell it because one thing that does happen sometimes when people study is that they're wonderful artists or illustrators they're, they're so strong with that um, and then um, it all goes um, tits up when you actually ask them to make what they've drawn. And then it, and then the lines start to get a little bit blurred. OK, well, you drew this, you sold it to us. Where is it? Can you make it? And then and then the pressure is on because they realize it's something completely different. And sometimes that can be a bit of a shock to the system for undergraduate students when, you know, you, you go to learn fashion design and it's more illustrative and when you actually start working and have um, clients or you know anyone else to to um cater for then you you come unstuck and you realize you're a bit lost and i think you know there are so many people who graduate from degrees like um fashion with not enough technical knowledge who then go back um to take evening classes to fill in the gaps that they didn't have whilst they were studying. So they still have that really strong creative handwriting identity, but in terms of actually bringing the drawing to life, that's where it becomes really difficult for some of them. Yeah. Um, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's, it's yeah. so much of this 2D, 3D aspect, even if you can make a drawing look 3D, it doesn't mean you've sorted out all the details of the 3D. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, and because you're an engineer, you'll have thought about that already. You know, um, you know, if you were doing, say, um, woven garments, so garments made on the sewing machine, you know, you're automatically going to think, okay, how are they going to get in and out? Um, and um, also, there's one funny story I learned from one of my pattern cutting um, teachers. Um, there was one girl who just, I think she. I don't know if she actually got on with this student, but that's by the by. The point is, is that she um, was designing something and she warned the student, this is not going to work. No, no human can get that on. Um, you need to create an opening somewhere that is big enough for the person to get it on through their head or step into it, something. I think it was a dress. Um, and she was ignored and then it all came unstuck on the day of the graduate fashion show when there was absolute chaos backstage because it had to just be made up <laughs> on the flight and then I think um, it was just I don't think she actually said I told you so but in a way she didn't really need to <laughs> and I feel like you know one often you know, I think drawing is really easy to improve drawing because, you know, it's good to have light. Or just draw from life is the main thing. Make sure that you're drawing, you're looking at something 3D rather from a photograph. And it's much easier to just get a pencil and just draw what you see and teach yourself a lot. Whereas I think the technical side that I think a lot of knitters have, especially if they've been knitting for a long time and maybe want to try designing, they've got so much going for them already. And I think sometimes they're way too put off by you know, what a designer is meant to be or the skills that they're meant to have. And it's, and I, they, they shouldn't, they shouldn't be, not, not for, not for that. Yeah. For that. Yeah. But, yeah. um, yeah, cause really, really what's important is that you, you can create the thing that you're trying to create, especially yeah. for us. Like we're not, yeah if you're submitting to like a third party yet yeah, you have to convince them that you know what you're doing and that they're gonna like the idea but really it doesn't have to look super fancy and perfect and polished like our job is to just make sure we can create the thing and make it reproducible so somebody else can create the thing 
Yeah, exactly. And then this is where, you know, your knitting skills can do the talking. Because, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're not confident about drawing, you're thinking about submitting to a third pub party publication, just sh show them the swatch. Yep. Show them more than one swatch. Yep. And, and, and do um, a it, mini sample of an yeah. idea. Mm -hmm. And exactly. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah because that's that counts as visual communication it doesn't just have to be drawing it's just something that you see that conveys the idea in the way that you want it to be conveyed that's all it is the mark making inky gouache type drawings just put it to one side you don't need it <laughs> yes yes um this whole conversation reminds me of i went to an art museum just a local art museum last month and there was this artist who i wish i like could have met him and like just had a discussion with him because it's obvious his brain just like just fascinated me but like he he would write letters to the museum director with his next idea and like the letters are his his painting of what his whole idea is he, he made like sculptures with like motors and extremely 3d and massive projects but here he's like creating this painting and the painting looks beautiful he's got all of his words that are his letter throughout like i have no idea how the guy read his letters um and then like their painting looks beautiful, but the sculpture like is something completely different. And they're both beautiful. The guy was a genius, but like they did not look the same. But at the same time, like nobody cares, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so you know. Anyway, yeah. Um, we only have fifteen minutes left, so. Uh, really? Oh my god! Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I have a tendency to do this. I. I just go off on a million tangents. So um, No, I'm having I'm having a great time. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not sorry at all. <laughs> Thank you. Um just like your personal life outside of knitting and designing. Do you have other hobbies and interests? What does your your day to day look like? Um gosh, I think I'll have to preface everything I'm about to say with when I have time. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I like um, mu I like music very much. Um, I mean, piano and guitar are my mm. ones that I have um, in my room now. Um, I was really lucky with my um, primary school that it had a music room, and so I got to learn um, four four instruments. Um, I started I learned the drums to an extent, and then the recorder, um, and then just love the piano and guitar most and then every any chance I get I just try and practice or um, write or write some music um, and then I'll also gardening as well um, just the, just for the, the pure escapism of both really and then also um, photography is something that I'm trying to learn although um, I am is coming along slowly <laughs> photography it's I am I'm too scared of using putting the camera on manual mode I have a very old camera that nobody would ever part exchange for anything it's that old um, but <laughs> it's got the safety net of the scene selection so I don't have to worry about adjusting any of the um, you know apertures and all that kind of stuff um, but it's a really nice outlet because if I don't have time to draw I can take a picture or of something and think about know other other things um that are connected just the compositions try and you know have that as a creative outlet um but yeah um yeah i can't think of, i can't think of anything else i think that's it I mean, what, what about what about your spare time as well um uh, what spare time <laughs> <laughs> no i'm i'm doing better especially since the summer, I kind of went through some burnout and just really trying to kindle those, that whole artsy creative side again, outside of knitting and designing. But I basically love anything I get my hands on. I, I enjoy playing with photography as well. Um, I have a violin and a cello. Oh, um, I, I, so I, I played violin in school and 
Well, that's a whole nother story. I, I'm the oldest child and I like had to beg and beg my parents to let me play violin and, or I wanted oh. to play cello and then, you know, finally got them convinced to let me do violin. My brother is a year younger and he plays cello. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, after I was away from home, I got a cello as well, but I, I've never had lessons on it. So I just tinker around. Um, but then I also love painting and sewing and, all of the things stamping and scrapbooking and yeah um and so i i'm not like amazing at any of them because i just dabble and just have fun and um painting's kind of been the one writing a little bit of poetry more recently but yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> oh gosh were well, your parents thinking about creating a string quartet amongst you is that why they didn't want you to learn the cello and gave it to your brother and <laughs> no no they they weren't familiar with strings at all and so they were like i think it was kind of just their own fears around it and stuff um mm -hmm. and anyway violin seemed like the most practical instrument and so and then but yeah, both of my brothers play cello and my sister plays violin. So we did end up with basically a corset. <laughs> um, did I say my sister plays violin? She plays viola. Anyway, so oh, okay. we have a viola, a violin, and two cellos. But <laughs> oh, so, they want, so one of the brothers needs to move on to the double bass. I'm sorry. One of yeah, them needs to do rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> I agree. Yes. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I, I said my youngest brother needed to, to play bass, but I also don't blame him for not wanting to, you know, lug out back and forth all the time, so. Yeah, uh, I see you. Yes. <laughs> um, so I, I think we could keep talking about hobbies forever, but I want to give you a little bit of time to show some of your designs or talk about some of your designs that you have. Um, well, apart from this one, I'll just come out a little bit so you can see. It's got um, raglan sleeves. Here's the star line detail here. I'll just, well, I don't know if the other side is easier to see or not, but anyway, yeah, but it's symmetrical. Um, <laughs> and it's got this um, collar, which is, um, I really want, I've been wanting to do knitted collars for ages, but ideas for about two more, and um, I thought just get get one out but you could knit this with a normal crew neck as well just have a ribbed finish if you wanted to and then the rib is just in single rib for the neck same as it is for the collar um what else have I got um I really haven't thought this through in terms of layout I'm really sorry this could be quite awkward oh. um <laughs> but um yeah I've got the Anita cardigan let me try and get that on here and that's a wrap cardigan just oh, yeah. there yeah and that was one of my first patterns i did i released that when i opened my pattern shop last year um it's just um it's got these darts at the um ribbing at the waist but you've also got the potential along here on the um princess line because i think that's just what it's called to um do increases here if you need more bust shaping if you have a fuller bust you can you know increase and then it anything will just be um decrease into gathers around here at the oak and that was one thing that I wanted to try to do to experiment with them um, bringing tailoring stuff into knitting um, so that's one and then I think probably a bit more normal for want of a better term um, is the Unite sweater and I really like this one um, hang on yeah because it was something I really love this. This was part of the collection that I did with um, Arnold Culliford Knitwear. And um, I love the teamwork element of that because it gave me so much freedom to just work on on creating a texture, um, a textured collection. And um, I think it was the first time in a long time that I had been able to work without any particular stress or having to do all the jobs at once. It was just having that taken care of. Um, so yeah and i think otherwise what else can i show you um this now i did tidy up the desk earlier this week because i knew this was going to happen um but here is just my little swatch um cubby hole um just where i have all the swatches um here that i'm working on and get some sneak peeks of stuff that's just randomly all over the place and um i just i love the peace of mind that that gives in that you know 
it's you're, I'm in a really awkward space. That's why I'm keeping everything very tightly angled. But the peace of mind of just being able to just um, shut stuff away when you're creative and you tend to work messily and you might not necessarily have time to tidy up. It's just, you know, shut the bureau lid. It's done. It's tidy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and so everything that I'm working on goes in this space and it's all in sort of very... Um, very early incumbent stages at the moment uh, I think after this um, sweater goes out it'll probably be a while before I do anything else but you know it depends I think one thing that I am learning sort of going back to what we were talking about earlier is just to not feel like I have to be on any kinds of seasonal schedule I think um, I wrote that in my newsletter last week um, just sort of changing how I was going to do things and I think the minute I the day I sent it I'd have a really good night's sleep and I think that you know like you taking a break from things over the summer going back to what you wanted to do I think you know honoring that is so important mm -hmm. and um whether it's you know just giving yourself space to just be human um whether that's slamming the door on a messy bureau or painting <laughs> you have to do it and the thing is is that when you've got really good people around you supporting your designs and what you're doing it makes it so much easier to you know take a break you know no one's really expecting you to be perfect um i'm saying that's partly to convince myself as well as know that it's true but um <laughs> you know the pressure being on all the time goes away when you know that you've got people rooting for you and they're just happy to support you yeah yeah um i would i mean there are a few people who i don't know how to say this in a nice way but there are some people who who expect people to be perfect and mm. so some of that is because that they're also putting that pressure on themselves and they're not allowing themselves to be human but i i do believe that the people who we truly want around us and who actually support us completely support us as humans <laughs> yeah exactly i mean that's part of what you're looking for i think one of the most nourishing spaces that i think i have is um, my newsletter community mm -hmm. um i mean and you must have that with the pattern design circle and with your newsletter as well because you know you've got people who've actually like chosen to get closer to you they've invited you yep i'm happy for you to show up in your inbox and i think that you know i'm even i'm just still slowly starting to wrap my head around exactly how giving and human that is yeah um and it's it's so precious isn't it mm -hmm. you know it's yeah and that's why mm -hmm. you know for any other business owners out there like that's why it's so important to attract the people that you want to work with because yeah. otherwise you're not going to have that comfortability to, to be yeah. to do what you want to do and explore to find what you want to do and navigate all of the things of life as a human <laughs> yeah exactly because you know you can use, you need space to be messy and to evolve and and to grow and you know that's part of it you know you can't just be doing the same thing all the time you've got to give yourself grace and space to grow and mm -hmm. yeah i completely agree yes knit and mary said uh, great advice have a great day thanks so much for oh, everybody who's you. been here live um i hope i hope you really enjoyed it and i hope you have a beautiful day uh mary and everybody watching and yeah, you, you now <laughs> it's been a lot of fun thank you Jessica. um so where can folks find you on the internet um, so my website is um, natalieinstitches.com and on there you can find the link to um, sign up to my newsletter. I also have a blog on there as well that I publish um, onto fortnightly and my pattern shop and things like that. But yeah, my newsletter is probably my favorite space. So yeah, you can sign up to that if, you, if you'd like to. Yes, I love that. Um, and if folks are interested in taking classes, from you yeah um so i have um a sleeves class coming up at vogue um next month um but i'm also piloting a knitwear design course to begin next month i've been doing it very quietly because um it, me it mean it means a lot i don't want to do it with any like massive fanfare 
Um, but we're going to start with, as it happens, a sort of visual communication module for about six weeks, um, starting in early November. Um, so yeah, join up on the mailing list or just write to me on the contact form if you want to hear more. And um, I think I'll probably take no more than about 15 people so I can keep it manageable and yeah, see what it develops into. I'm hoping it can grow into a really valuable resource for people in years to come. Yes, wonderful. And for anybody who is inside the design circle, um, we'll be chatting with Natalie again in December about fun with Factory. So that'll be a lot of fun. I know folks yes. loved our chat on raglans uh, and, and the whole technicality aspect of that because there are a lot of our guest speakers don't dive in deep onto the technical aspects and it was much appreciated so <laughs> oh, well, thank you. i'll make sure that i am primed and ready <laughs> oh, no, no 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 pressure like come up as you are you are you will be well loved and received so <laughs> don't worry <laughs> Uh, thank you everybody for for listening in. Thank you for all of your time to date. This was this was so wonderful. I, I love these chats so much. Uh, it's it's been such a pleasure to just hang out. Oh my the hour yes. the hour just flew by. So Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um do you have anything oh I guess you already said you don't really have much for designs coming up. So what um, uh, just, just this one. one. Yeah, later oh. this month and um the rest are ready when they're ready. I think um, if you want to, I think what I'm going to do in the newsletter is just show things that I'm working on in progress. So if you wanted to get any sneak peeks of what's coming up, the mailing list is the best place to be. I'm not going to put anything out in the public until it's ready to be published. So it's just to see I am working, I am working, I am doing something, just not in publishing mode. <laughs> wonderful wonderful well thank you so much and have a beautiful evening yeah you too jessica thanks for having me yeah i'll talk to you later